Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank God for being in the house of God one more time. Amen. For truly, he is a good God. And his mercy doth endure forever. Amen. Amen. And this morning's Christian education, we're going to continue in the lesson regarding all things work together for the good. And we will, our, our background and our foundational scriptures even come from Romans the 8th chapter. And Romans the 8th chapter, starting in verse 24, is where I want to land. Amen. Romans 8. And I thank God this morning for this beautiful Sunday morning. Thank him so much for being in this place. Somebody say in this place. Amen. Because God has enabled us and he has blessed us to be in this place. So I truly give him glory and honor and praise. And we have um, the Christian education notes from um, January 31st, 2021, where Bishop taught this originally, um, at least to my knowledge, it was original teaching. But um, from that time, he may have been teaching on it before. But the printed notes that I have are from January 31st, 2021. So I want to um, start on page. Let's go down to Romans 8, 24. And we're going to start reading in Romans 8 and 24. And the word of God reads, it says, For we are saved by hope. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is not hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. And we're still talking about the real meaning of Romans the 8 and 28 verse. Um, and we'll read down into that. But I want to refresh us this morning on this hope that we have. And because we have this hope in God and because we have this hope in Jesus Christ and because we have this hope uh, of the Holy Spirit and he abides and dwells and resides on the inside of our human spirit, um, they work together for us not only to obtain this hope, but to maintain and to retain. Amen. So the Holy Spirit's job, he, one of his jobs, I should say, is when he comes in, he helps us to obtain the hope. And I've been teaching the series on the conscience and how uh, the Holy Spirit will knock on the door of your conscience. And when you open that door, he's able to apply the blood of Jesus. Amen. And at that time, you're able to obtain this hope that Paul is talking about here in Romans, the eighth chapter, verse 24. So you're saved by this hope when the blood of Jesus has been applied to your conscience. And he, he, that blood is not only applied to the conscience, but he goes deep down on the inside of your spirit. And then he begins to do a work and work outwardly onto your soul. And those things that are in your soul, your affections, your emotions, your desires, your will, all those things. But the, the spirit has to come in and penetrate that human spirit and touch that conscience so he can begin to work. And as he begins to work, he enables you to obtain the hope. In other words, he comes in and gives you access so that you might obtain this hope. So we're saved by this hope. So the spirit comes in and he helps us to obtain the hope. He, kept, he comes in and he helps us maintain and retain this hope. Amen. So those words are kind of our key, some of our key words this morning, obtain, maintain, and retain. Amen. Because when he comes in, it's, it's not good enough for him to just come in and help us to obtain this hope. It's not good enough for us to just have the hope one day and there's no maintenance plan involved. Amen. But he has to help us to maintain it. It's like a vehicle. You know, once you purchase the vehicle, um, at certain points of the life of that vehicle, you must come in and do some maintenance so that you can be able to retain and keep the vehicle as long as you desire to keep it. As long as you're maintaining it, then the vehicle will last a long time. It's the same way with our spirit when the Holy Spirit comes in. 
if as long as we are being maintained by the Holy Spirit, as long as we're allowing him to come in and maintain this hope within us, then it's retained as long as it's being maintained. Amen. So this hope that we have, we're saved by it because the spirit gives us access to obtain it. Amen. So, but the hope that is seen is not hope. So we're talking about something that we don't see, but the spirit sees this hope that we have. And he was just waiting on us so that he could apply it. The word of God over the book of Isaiah says that he would wait for us, that he may be gracious unto us. So he had been waiting and waiting and waiting so that he could be gracious unto us. Amen. So when he comes in, he gives us something that we can't physically see, but he doesn't deal in the tangible, but he deals in the intangible. He works, the Holy Spirit works in the intangible because this hope is intangible. Amen. So he said, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? In other words, when you're talking about things that you can see, those are things that the spirit is really not so concerned about when it comes to your salvation. He is more concerned with those things that cannot be seen, i.e. this hope, because he is on assignment when he comes to you. And when he's knocking on the door of your conscience, he's on assignment to come in there and bring within there something that you can't see but only he can see and the father and the son can see. Amen. So, but if we hope for that, we see not. If we begin to hope for that, we see not. Then the spirit, that's the realm he operates in because it's spiritual. Amen. And so he comes in when we begin to hope for that, we see not talking about hoping for heaven, hoping for an immortal body, hoping to be changed from mortal to immortal or an immortal body hoping to be just like Jesus, because that's what that equates to, amen. Because the Bible says that when we see Jesus, we shall be like him, just like him. And so when we see Jesus, and, and I want to pause there for a moment, because we are still talking about all things working together. So the Holy Spirit, when he comes in, he's working with the Father, simultaneously with the Son, and they're working on us so that we can, now we've obtained the hope. So I'm going to go a little further. Now he's maintaining this hope that we have. And because we are now waiting patiently for it. What are we waiting patiently for since we've obtained the hope? Well, we're waiting patiently for our bodies to be changed from mortal to immortality. And in that day, when that happens, that means, again, we will be just like Jesus. We will die no more. Amen. We will be in heaven. We will be um, a part of the kingdom of God in heaven. We're already a part of the kingdom of God now. We're just waiting for our bodies to be changed. As the Bible says, we're waiting for the adoption to wit or to witness the change. Amen. And so down in verse 26, it says, likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. And so sometimes we are um, we have infirmities that we may not realize that are keeping us from, uh, wanting to retain the hope that we have. So I, I, I will say that we've all obtained this hope. Let's, let's say for example, but then along the course of life, there are things that come up that try to attack your retention. Amen. There are things and the retention of this hope to be more specifically, to be more specific. And so I'm going to flip over to Romans, the eighth chapter in verse 17, because things come into our lives and they try to make us forget what we have. And verse 17 says, and if children, then heirs, and not only forget who we, what we have, but who we have and who we are or whose we are. Amen. And if children, then heirs. So when the spirit of the Lord comes in, knocks on the door of your conscience, applies the blood of Jesus at this particular point in time, you have become a child or an heir. And so if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. 
So the necessity of the spirit to come in is so that he can cause us to be adopted so that we can become children and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And this is all a part of this hope that we have received once the spirit of the Lord comes in and applies the blood. Amen. And if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And so there are some things that come in our lives along the way for the namesake of the gospel, for the namesake of Jesus Christ. Things do come in our lives. Amen. And it's not because the Lord has ordered those things to come in our lives, but it is because when you switch kingdoms and we've been talking about this, we have been translated now since the blood has been applied to our conscience, to our soul, to our spirit. We have been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. We have changed laws now. We have gone from the law of sin and death to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So the enemy recognizes the transition. Somebody say amen. The enemy recognizes the deliverance. Somebody say amen. The enemy recognizes that you have gone from one leadership to another. Amen. So, Paul goes down to verse 18 and he says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, Paul recognized there were sufferings in the present life. So he says that he reckons that, or, you know, I really believe that, or I feel strongly that, or I even know that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. So these things that come into our lives, the enemy has ordered things to come into our lives. And the misconception has been in a lot of instances, once you are translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus, that God begins to order things in our lives. But that's a big, big misconception from the enemy because what the enemy does not want us to realize is that he has been ordering our demise all along. Somebody say amen. So the sufferings of this present time don't come from God the Father. They don't come from Jesus Christ the Son. And they don't come from the Holy Ghost, but they come from Satan himself. The evil one, the wicked one, the one who is coming in to be the accuser of the brethren. He accused Job. He ordered all these different things. He accuses you on a daily basis. So those sufferings, Paul is reckoning, that they're not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And Paul knew that the glory that should be revealed in us begins with this, this hope that we have. Because you must have this hope in order for this glory to be revealed. Because the hope leads to the spirit and the spirit leads you to heaven. And when you have the Holy Spirit, the spirit is able to cause you to believe what you're reading in the word of God. And specifically in this particular verse, he, un he helps us to understand that the sufferings of this present time are not ordered by God, but they're ordered by the enemy. And not only that, but they can't even be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us once our bodies are changed from mortal to immortality. Because again, when we see Jesus, we're going to be just like him. And what does that mean on a basic level? That means that our bodies are going to be just like his body. They're going to be changed from mortal to immortality. Why is that so important? Because you'll never have to suffer another day in a mortal body. You won't be subjected to the trials and the tribulations in a mortal body. You don't have to worry about dying in an immortal body. You don't have to worry about sickness in an immortal body. You don't want to have to worry about uh, all the things that we currently face on a day-to-day -day basis in an immortal body. And so this hope that we're saved by strengthens that belief that one day when Jesus comes, that these sufferings that we're going through down here, they're not worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed when Jesus comes back on the cloud. Amen. Amen. And so I want to jump back over here 
over to uh, verse 26, Romans 8 and 26. And Romans 8 and 26 says, likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Infirmities are a lot of different things, but the Dakes Bible, the, the King James version of the Finnish Dakes Bible says, our physical, our mental, our moral weaknesses are flaws. These are likened unto or, or considered um, infirmities. And so I read it again. Infirmity, by definition, physical, mental, or moral weakness or flaws. So the Holy Spirit comes in. So we've talked about him knocking on the door of our conscience, applying the blood. So when he comes in, he identifies the infirmities. Because prior to the Spirit coming in, you know, we, we talk a lot of times uh, about being self-aware. And that's a good thing. And so many of us have taken the steps to say, you know what, I'm going to do better in 2021. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Those things that we have declared that we're going to do typically result from us being certain uh, to a certain degree self-aware. But when the spirit comes in, he spotlights, he highlights the infirmities that we have, not to our detriment, but for our good. And sometimes we don't want to really know the, the, the depth of our infirmities because when without the spirit, I would only highlight the things that were important to me. But when the spirit comes in and he identifies the infirmities, he highlights the things that are important to God. And that's the difference. I'll say that again. Before the spirit came in, I would only highlight or identify the infirmities that I was self-aware of that were important to me. But the, the, one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is when he comes in, he highlights and identifies the infirmities that are important to God. Why is that important? Because God knows what I need to be, how I need to be, and who I need to be in order to please him. And y'all know, I always say God gives you what you need to give him what he wants. Essentially that boils down to the Holy spirit. He gives you who you need to give you, to give him what he wants. And so the Holy spirit's job, one of those jobs, I should say, when he comes in, he comes in and he identifies and helpeth our infirmities. It says, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. That's, that's an infirmity that he listed. But there are so many other infirmities that I'm not aware of until the spirit reveals them to me that are important to God. But one of them is that he identified, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. That is a key component here of, of us retaining and maintaining this hope. Because when we have the spirit come in and identify these infirmities, i.e. the specific one that's pointed out, knowing what we should pray for, then this basically goes up before God. And God looks at this and says, you know what? You've pointed out this Holy Spirit and she is in agreement or he is in agreement that this infirmity needs to be nailed to the cross. Yes, sir. It reminds me of the scripture we opened up with where towards the end it said, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me of secret faults. Yes. Who can understand his errors as Psalms 19 specifically put. And it says further, cleanse thou me of secret faults. And, and the writer said this because he knew that the secret faults were the things that were secret to us, but known to God. I'm going to say that again. He knew that the writer, that Psalm 19, David, he knew that the secret faults were secret to us, but known by God. And so when he asked, David said, cleanse thou me of secret faults in Psalm 19. Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. He was talking about sins that are presumptuous, meaning sins that you know better and should not be doing because you just know. So, and he knew the spirit knew. Amen. And so talking about these infirmities, 
and talking about these secret things, these secret faults, talking about sin on top of that, all the things that would separate us, keep us from getting close to God. But Paul, over in Romans 8 and 26, he says, for we know not what we should pray for as, as we ought. When he said that the spirit helpeth our infirmities, he knew that that was one of the number one things that he needed to list out because a lot of times we're going to prayer or we're getting down in prayer, asking God for this, asking God for that. But there's an infirmity in that. There's a infirmity and the definition again said physical, mental or moral weaknesses or flaws is identified as infirmities. There's a, there's a moral weakness. There is a mental flaw. There is something that could cause me not to get close or have access to God the way I need to have access to God. And not knowing what to pray for as I ought is one of them. Amen. Not knowing what I should ask God is one of them. And so it makes it even a stronger case for the Holy Spirit to be within my human spirit and have applied that blood to my conscience and applied that blood on the inside of my spirit. So that way he points to all the things to make me aware of what God is asking of me and what, how God wants me to change. Amen. But the spirit itself or himself maketh intercession for us. So not only does he help the infirmity starting off with helping me to pray what I'm supposed to pray, but he also makes intercession or intercedes, steps in the gap, comes within the breach and, and repairs that. He comes in and is the repair of the breach for me with groanings which cannot be uttered. In other words, when I'm groaning down in prayer and I really don't know what I should be saying. Sometimes I only know to say, Lord, help me. But the spirit steps in and intercedes and he says, ah, I know what that means. I know what that Lord help me means. I know what this means. I know what that means. He steps in and interprets the groanings and the sighing and the tears and the pain. He steps in and he intercedes and he's my translator. Can you say amen? amen. He translates what I am saying when I don't even know what I'm saying, but he takes it back to God and he steps in the gap for us. And he lets God know these are the things that are on his or her heart. That's what he does for you. That's what he does for me. And in 27, Romans 8 and 27, it says, and he that searches the hearts, then Jesus steps in because he's working with the spirit. Amen. And he's working collaboratively to search the hearts of us because he knows what's the mind of the spirit or the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit comes back and says, this is what she was groaning and uttering today. Then Jesus, knowing the mind of the spirit, knowing that the spirit of the Lord has our best interests at heart, they begin to work together to say, you know what? Let's do something about this because she needs this, this, and this. So then he works with the spirit collaboratively to make sure that these infirmities that would try to come in as, as David said in one scripture, he said, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. So the spirit comes in, works with Jesus, interprets my groanings that cannot be uttered. In other words, can't put it into words in English, turns around and takes that and intercedes for me because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they're working and they know the will of God because they're working with God, collaborating with God. They know what the will of the Father is. So then we get down to Romans 8 and 28. And my subheading in my Bible says God's work in lives delivered from sin. So after the spirit has come in and delivered, after he's come in and set free, after he's come in and done all these things, then he opens our eyes to realize who is working for us. Because at the beginning of our stages in our walk in Christ, 
we don't necessarily know how things are working in the background. All we know is something is working or someone is working. But we don't necessarily understand, usually as, as we start off in Christ, who is working and the depth that they're working, how they're working. But by the time Paul gets to Romans 8 and 28, he says, and we know, because by the time we get here, he's saying we should know. We know. In other words, he gave them credit that they know by now that all things work together for good. And he wasn't talking about um, the bad things. He wasn't talking about all the things that come into your life to try to destroy you or discourage you or try to cause you to turn away from God and not seek the face of God and, and not cause you to call on the name of Jesus and ask for help. No, he's saying all things work together. In other words, everything that God does for you, it works together for your good. And while God is doing all these things, collaborating with the Son, collaborating with the Holy Spirit, working things out for your good, the enemy is always trying to counteract that. So we have to be very self-aware in the Spirit, allowing him to come in and help us to make us aware that the enemy is always trying to detract from, take away from, take away from us the things that are working in our behalf. You get a promotion on your job. God opened the door for you to get that. And here comes the enemy because you're naming the name of Christ. You're seeking the face of the father. You're, you've allowed the Holy Spirit to come in and the enemy is not pleased. So what does he do? He comes in to try to cut up. But the Bible says, if you resist the enemy, he will flee. And so what we have to find ourselves doing is resisting the enemy and knowing that God is still working out things for our good. It doesn't take away the fact that God gave you the promotion. It doesn't take away the fact that God worked this, this, and this out. But the enemy always has a counter plan. And we must know that God didn't send the counter plan. But God sent the plan. And as I always default to uh, Jeremiah 29 and 11, he knows the thoughts. God knows the thoughts that he thinks towards you. And they are good and they are not of evil. And it's to give you an expected end, a good expected end. So when bad things come into your life, you must still fall on this scripture knowing that all things work together for the good. The all things are the things that God is doing for you. And when he's on your side, He's always doing something good for you. Amen. And so we have to really understand this and believe this because all things work together for the good has always uh, eluded me before I had the right understanding, the right revelation. Cause I was thinking from time to time that this bad thing happened, that bad thing, but it's going to work out for my good. No, the enemy sends those things to happen. He sends the negative things. He sends all the stuff to happen to cause you to be discouraged. But don't give him credit like God is working with the devil to do that against you. No. Because what will happen is the enemy will come in and try to make you comfortable with going through trials and tribulations because he wants you to attribute that to God. And so he disguises himself when he's doing these things against you. And so after a while, if we are not careful, he will cause us to just say, okay, it's okay. You can just beat me down. It's okay, devil. You can just tear me up. Okay, devil. You can just rip me to shreds. Okay, devil. No, because what happens is when he does that, he can get you to a point where you forget about not only the fact that you've obtained this hope, not only the fact that the spirit has been maintaining this hope, but the devil will cause you to forfeit so that you will no longer retain this hope that you have. And then you'll find yourself, if you're not careful, not looking for Jesus' appearing. Because 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13 talks about the rapture or the coming of the Lord. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And so if we give uh, way to a passiveness when it comes to things working against us, then our focus will be on the things working against us and not the things that are working for us. And the enemy has done that to a lot of people, cause them to focus on the things that are against them and cause them to almost revel in that and give glory in that. 
So I want to encourage you this morning as we close our Christian education. The sufferings of this time are the things that we're going through right now. But these things should not have the glory because they did not come from God. Be careful who you give the glory to. I'm going to say that again. Be careful who you give the glory to because Paul said, he talked about that in verse 18, for I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. But if you give glory to the wrong one, then you may miss out on the glory that's going to be revealed within you. In other words, when Jesus comes on the cloud and your body is changed to a, the Bible calls it a glorious body. So as I close, I'm going to read 28, Romans 8 and 28 again. And we know, so we should know by now is what Paul is saying, that all things work together for good. The Father is working. The Son is working. The Holy Spirit is working. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Amen? Amen.